he's actually, Al uh, Ababi, if I could start with, with yourself. So the zones group in the UAE has, has built a lot of industrial zones and, and used those as, as a technique. Um, what I wanted to ask you for your thoughts on um, was how they can be used to overcome infrastructure problems. I mean, a lot of countries around the world have terrible infrastructure, right? It's one of their key barriers for development. Uh, I guess particularly if we think about, um, well, Africa is a great example. It's the key barrier um, to, to developing a manufacturing sector there is bad infrastructure. Can zones overcome that by themselves or is integration with the surrounding geography a must? First of all, uh, Simon, right? Yes. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, I hope that will add uh, value to the audience with the information that we'll, we'll give out. I think without your partners, you're not going to achieve what you're looking for. It is a true partnership between the private sector and the government to implement sustainable infrastructure. A zone score where we come we come with partners to develop the infrastructure, taking loans from the, from the, uh, the financial institutions, developing the infrastructure, and working to attract investors to develop these uh, uh, industrials. So with, the, with this model, sustainability is a key. Mm -hmm. You need a partnership. You need a financial model that works. It's a win-win situation. Without it, you're not going to achieve a sustainable infrastructure. And on the other side, on the government side as well, the government have implemented so many policies developing sustainable infrastructure and developing institutions like Master MIT Institution to, to develop technologies toward sustainable infrastructure, not to only sustainable technologies. So from the government's perspective, we're investing heavily in the education sector to develop technologies for sustainable infrastructure. From, from an enabler like ZoneScore, we mm -hmm. partner with the financial institutions to fund this sustainable infrastructure for the private sector to come and develop their financial uh, uh, projects on them. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an organic thing. Uh, uh, every piece of it plays a big part of making the infrastructure sustainable. And what's the role of zones in, the, in that process? Can, it, can a zone um, create its own infrastructure um, to, say, provide a, a good port in a country that doesn't otherwise have one? Or do you need good infrastructure in the country first before a zone can be successful? Uh, I think that's a fundamental question and a very basic one. Uh, the government needs to have the sustainable and world-class infrastructure for the private sec uh, sector to nourish. Uh, give an example in Abu Dhabi and the, uh, the neighboring countries. Uh, we're investing heavily in our uh, infrastructure like the airport, like the, uh, the, the port, Kizad, as well as the power generation projects. This is all to improve our economy and to enhance the private sector uh, uh, growth in the future. So without putting in place the right infrastructure from the government side, you will not achieve what you're looking for from the private sector. And the government responsibility not only to fund these projects on its own from the budget of the government, you have to be smart enough for the private sector to even participate in funding these projects. Mm -hmm. When I say uh, the private sector, I'm saying the financial institutions need to play a big part of funding these projects uh, to, to, to develop the, uh, this infrastructure, like the mm -hmm. airport, like the, the port. Mm -hmm. These projects can generate money for the government. These projects can create jobs and wealth for the, for the Emirates. So if it has financial income, it has a financial return, then it's a feasible, then it's bankable. So it's, it's a chain of uh, uh, thing that once you put in place all the pieces, thinking of the future and making it sustainable, it works for the banking sector and the financial, it works for the government and building an infrastructure for the private sector to come mm -hmm. and invest in. Okay. 
You see, the, the financing point is a very important one, and um, it's a good opportunity to bring in uh, Hans-Peter Egler from the Global Infrastructure um, Basel. And it, Hans-Peter, if I think about um, the global economy at the moment, one of the key factors is, or the characteristics, is a big savings glut. Yep. So interest rates are very, very low. Um, one reason for that is that we have a lot of savings going around looking for returns. Uh, it doesn't have a lot to invest in. Um, big savings rates in, in developed markets um, in, in Europe and particularly also in East Asia, Japan, China, um, also, I mean, here in the, in the Gulf is also a big source of global savings. So we've got all these global savings uh, sloshing around looking for a home. Um, we seem to have a massive infrastructure deficit all around the world, uh, no shortage of places that need better ports, better roads, and these are things that would probably pay for themselves uh, with increased economic activity. So uh, what is the problem? Uh, why? <laughs> there seems an obvious solution there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you pointed out the right points, actually. The situation today is we have a, a huge liquidity of money in the market. Uh, immense needs. I mean, we have to think that by 2050, the infrastructure which is needed there, only a third part is uh, created uh, now. So 50, uh, six, uh, 75 percent will have to be still uh, established. So there's a huge market opportunity. The big problem, however, is that the project pipeline is really uh, dry, so to say. There are not enough bankable projects, there are not enough interesting projects for the private sector to team up on one hand side. On the other hand side, we have another regulatory issue associated, uh, particularly for institutional investors and pension funds. Today, it's still very difficult to invest outside their own countries and uh, um, up to a certain uh, percentage because today uh, it's limited only to a few percentages they can invest in these alternative investments as they are called now. Infrastructure is a part of alternative investments uh, such uh, like uh, uh, raw materials and other investments and therefore it's also very difficult for private sector and asset managers to uh, to really invest in also existing infrastructure projects. So we have on one hand side uh, a lack of projects and uh, a lack of possibilities to re-inject money because uh, all infrastructures would, uh, all uh, investors would like to have uh, liquid assets and not too many bound assets and therefore it's important to have a possibility to inject money and to take out the money again if needed for all in individuals. So this is a structural problem uh, we are facing. In addition to that, uh, a lot of uh, countries have not yet uh, developed such strategies as His Excellency was explaining before, a, a real understanding on how to work together between the public sector, private sector, uh, as well as civil society, as well as the consumers, because finally uh, infrastructure is there to serve consumer needs and industry needs, and therefore it has to be teamed up. So we have to have a different approach to infrastructure development as compared to the past, because in the past, particularly in Europe, a lot of infrastructure projects have been financed by the public sector, but the public sector has not enough money uh, now because inf investments have shifted from uh, infrastructure investments more towards social investments to the right, so, but this has to be complemented by the private sector. Not only with money, but also with know-how, with ideas, with dynamic, because uh, infrastructure in the future will be far more dynamic, will have to serve multi-purposes and not just one. And we have to take into consideration much more or many more elements from the environment, because environment bears risks as the social sector also 
bears risk, and these risks has to be, have to be mitigated via sustainable and resilient infrastructure projects in the future. I mean, I, I'm really sur I'm sort of, uh, I guess, really surprised to hear you say there's not enough projects, right? Because it seems like we, we, could, we could list 100 here for you. Uh, we, we've had, we, we brought up many over, over the course of the last few days. Um, and I, then you, you bring up the liquidity issue. Um, so what's the, what's the solution there? I mean, do we need a return to the kind of more complex financial products that sort of, you know, have been out of, out of fashion since 2008? Um, or is there something else that needs to be done? I would rather uh, say, I would uh, uh, define it a little bit different. We have a lot of good ideas on the plan. We have a lot of needs. But this has to be turned down to solid project proposals which are backed by a solid policy and a visionary thinking and a systematic approach. I mean, we have a lot of smart cities called, but often this is just a smart city project. There needs to be a different approach, a, a visionary approach, a systematic shift towards a more uh, sectoral and systematic thinking. This is very important. And then we need the skills to develop these projects accordingly, and particularly in the public sector, which is still responsible for the concession development, for the PPP development. So there, the skills and the know-how is key. So therefore, capacity building and good education are key elements to really have a, a solid ground for the de uh, development mm -hmm. of new and uh, a lot of new projects. If I can add uh, Yeah. Uh, I, I think 100%, you need a vision. You need, you, need, you need clarity. The private sector needs transparency. Uh, if you have a vision from, from the regulators, from the government, uh, clear to, uh, to the private sector, transparent, uh, uh, and there is a target ahead of you. I think the private sector will come, and you will bring serious investors. In some places, you will you will lack this vision. Mm -hmm. You will lack the, uh, the the communication between the regulators with the with the investors. That relationship need to be like we have here. We have investors, we have regulators, we have the government. Once you have that environment in place, you will attract more investors. Money, we always say, we have a saying in Arabic, we say, Ras al Jaban, if I can say it in English, uh, uh, capital money is coward. Uh, you have to make sure that the, 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 the way forward is clear for them, transparent, uh, with, uh, backed by a vision mm -hmm. for the private sector to put their money on it. So Sorry. I wouldn't yeah. mind um, just getting into a, a, a case that came up yesterday. So Hans-Peter, we had a... We had Pakistan's Minister for Industry um, up here yesterday afternoon, and of course, huge issue for Pakistan is the lack of electricity. Um, so, okay, there's a need, right? So we know there's a need there, and we know that um, the economy's growing pretty fast, could certainly grow faster if, if they had a better electricity supply. So what specifically would, say, in that example, be needed to turn that need into a bankable project that could attract savings? I mean, uh, Pakistan is a good example. This was one of the first countries having established the PPP and BOT, uh, a regulatory framework. But then some political unrest uh, showed that this is very difficult to invest in, in, in certain countries. So it's, it's, a, it's a key element. So you need to have, as an investor, you need to have security. You need to have a clear vision of a strong regulatory framework. Unless you have this in place, it will always be very, very difficult. So uh, you can nowadays um, uh, watch the doing business reports from the World Bank. You have all the indications. You understand how difficult or how easy it is to uh, establish businesses, to do business in countries. So this is now very transparent. You can compare between the different economies and then you obviously go where uh, the rating is best and you invest there. 
Let me now bring in Dr. Ibrahim um, while we've been talking about the energy sector. So you're now with the World, the world Energy Council. Um, energy has got a lot of challenges. There's uh, a lack of supply in many places, uh, climate change and sustainability, uh, big requirements needed to change the energy sector. From the perspective of us here thinking about manufacturing, of course, we're, we're thinking about topics like electrification of, uh, of vehicles um, and how power sources in, uh, in manufacturing might change over the future. From your perspective, like being involved with many different countries, sort of planning and thinking about their energy systems, uh, what keeps global energy leaders awake at night? Okay, thank you very much. And um, I think the issue of energy is no more a local issue. It's really a global issue. And um, the different challenges facing the, the energy sector, like uh, the environmental issue, the, like, uh, the huge demand, and all in different uh, regions, and at the same time, the huge resources in other areas, leads us to, to work together, to cooperate. And uh, as World Energy Council, we set uh, what we call the energy trilemma that includes energy security, energy access, and the environmental dimension. This is our three uh, uh, dimensions that we usually evaluate and deal with the, the energy sector. So to satisfy this and satisfy the needs huge needs for energy, I think we have to work together globally. And there is initiative what is called the, the global interconnection for interconnecting the whole world with one network. Sometimes we feel that it is something cannot be achieved, but I personally believe that we can do something like that. Uh, the renewable energy resources, the distributed all over the world. Some region like Africa, for example, it has huge resources for renewable energy, but at the same time, they are not um, able or they don't have the, the tools to, to use it. So why not to cooperate with others, even to bring the industry as an element for this. So I think we have to work together to satisfy our needs globally in the energy sector. You have quite a uh, strong background working in Africa on, in energy infrastructure. Um, now, you say that Africa has uh, big renewable energy potential. Okay, so, mm -hmm. so that's true. There's big hydro, say, in, in DR Cong D DRC. Um, mm -hmm. Congo, there's also obviously a lot of solar, um, uh, particularly in, in North Africa and uh, wind energy in the south and in other places. But at the same time, isn't the reality that um, the sort of financing that requires um, and the speed at which energy needs to be delivered, uh, it's just not going to be possible to develop a sustainable system. And what we're actually seeing today is just a continuing build of, uh, of fossil sources um, in Africa. Okay, um, if you permit me, I'll go back to yesterday's session, which was uh, in the afternoon, focus on Africa. And we can remember that all the panelists and stressed that the integration is one of the most important issues for Africa, for development in general, and for uh, industrialization and manufacturing development in the continent. And uh, this is why, as I was the commissioner responsible for infrastructure and energy in the African Union Commission, and we were dealing with this issue of infrastructure. And um, we realized that from the beginning that we should go regionally uh, to, to develop something in uh, the national level. It's not the working method for our development as, as a continent. So that the concentration or the target was to have regional projects, to have the interconnection, 
to create regional markets, not only for energy, but for all uh, other uh, areas. Um, uh, and, and also to, to use and to pool uh, the resources available and the capacities available in the continent. So this created a strategy for Africa, led by the African Union, to put the, um, the, um, the program for developing infrastructure in the continent up to 2040. Mm -hmm. That includes energy, transport, uh, information and communication technology, and also uh, boundary, um, the waters, waters in the continent. Mm -hmm. So this program was adopted by the whole uh, uh, continent leaders in their summit, and it is under implementation now. And I may go back to the issue of financing. I think we can say it clearly, the stability of the country is one of the most important elements that encourage investment and private sector to come in. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, now, uh, as, as a continent, mm -hmm. uh, we have these programs. And if I go back to the energy sector, we have our plan for generation, for uh, transmission and networks, for renewable energy, and energy efficiency. And there are so many initiatives uh, in the continent uh, and supported by partners from everywhere, uh, especially for renewable energy mm -hmm. initiative in Africa that is, was uh, announced uh, during uh, COP21 in Paris. And mm -hmm. now we are in the implementation phase. And I think with all this development in uh, many of uh, our countries in Africa for creating the uh, environment that encourages uh, the private sector to come in for the regulatory bodies and for the regulatory reforms happening. I think this will encourage the private sector, not only private sector, but all investors from all over the world to come in and participate in implementing mm -hmm. our uh, plans. Well, one, um, one big investor in infrastructure in Africa in recent years has been China. So this is probably a good moment to, uh, to bring in Mr. Uh, Mr. Wang. Um, Mr. Wang is going to speak in Chinese, so you might want to put your, your headsets on if you don't have them on already. Um, just before I, uh, I move on to Mr. Wang, we do have a short um, three-minute video to show, which uh, we'll just queue up now.
Okay, so uh, uh, some good visuals there about um, the kind of infrastructure that uh, Mr. Wang is, is involved in. So, Mr. Wang, in, um, you work for the, the China Rail Rolling Stock Company, so I guess like many companies in China, uh, it's one of the world's biggest in its sector, um, and uh, one that has been in investing abroad um, in, in recent years. In your experience, what is the role of infrastructure in development? If, if you want to use infrastructure to develop your economy, what are um, the important things to consider to make that a success? Sochi 和基础设施的建设中国现在有一吨的就一千一吨的干柴和一点二万亿吨的水泥举一个例子大家都知道中国的首都北京和中国的这个经营中心上海之间是一千二百公里那么在今后高铁我们用四小四个多小时从北京可以跑到上海改变了这个城市
I'm going to soon um, come out to the audience, so please do uh, get ready to stick your hand up um, with, uh, with some questions for either the whole panel or one member in particular. Um, just one final question from me before I, I go to the audience. So, Mr. Wang, you spoke about um, the benefits that high-speed rail can bring, um, but wouldn't you think that high-speed rail is not a priority? for most countries. Um, I mean, if, if you're a, a, a developing country, um, things like roads and ports, uh, energy, water, uh, are probably going to provide much bigger dividends. High-speed rail is um, expensive, even in wealthy countries. Uh, they often find that the projects don't bring a lot of value. Um, wh why should rail be prioritised? Uh 昨天这个迪拜路交通局的局长对迪拜的交通做了一个非常美好的这个描述我非常的这个赞同比如说阿联酋这个国家从迪拜到阿布扎比啊一百二十公里如果说我们有高速铁路的话啊二十分钟就可
uh, an area in, for industry, for uh, development, this will really uh, improve the services offered to the ships uh, moving and connecting uh, uh, this or using uh, the, the canal itself. Okay. This is in brief. <laughs> Something there on the Suez Canal. Question down the front here. Uh, hello, Krzysztof Tabczewski from Hyper Poland. I have a question to Mr. Uh, Wang Jun. Uh, yesterday, uh, we heard a lot about the uh, innovative mode of transportation, the Hyperloop and the aerial drones. And the day before, we had an interesting speech from the Hyperloop One company. Uh, I wonder what's the opinion of this innovative mode of transportation uh, on the, from the China uh, government and uh, your company. Are you planning to invest in uh, any of those uh, modes of transportation? So is, is China prioritizing uh, transport options like the, uh, the Hyperloop One and the, 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 new, the new methods? So, thank you very much for your question. The future of the future of the future is very important to focus on technology. So, we have to plan the future of 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 the future. 创新的这种技术体系，啊，那么在轨道交通方面，我们主要有这么几个方面，啊，第一个，呃，我们在规划啊超高速磁浮列车，啊，它也是一种新的这个运输方式。那么中低速磁浮运输的这种技术模式，我们在国内已经有了商业运用，啊，已经有了好几条线的商业运用。那么我们在高速磁浮，我们在上海的这个浦东到上海的机场，我们有一条高速磁浮。那么我们未来可能在啊更高速度，比如说我们呃六百公里的超高速磁浮，也是我们啊未来五年的啊一个啊一个规划。啊，另外我们通过这个磁浮技术加真空管道，那么我们超这个高速的列车也在规划和研究之中。当然，轨道交通速度是是一个方面，实际上轨道交通的技术创新还有诸多方面需要解决，比如说智能化啊，我们这个呃信息化、云计算啊，给旅客带来这个超值的这种服务，比如说低碳、绿色、环保、节能，比如说给旅客提供一个移动的办公环境、娱乐环境，让他们在车上就是可以生活和工作啊，给。客客户带来这种超值的这种价值，啊，为客户做好服务，等等，在诸多方面我们都有规划。呃，我可以呃告诉大家，欢迎大家，二零一八年在柏林的轨道交通展，啊，去参观我们中国中车的展呃展台，到时我们有很多的新技术，在二零一八年的柏林轨道交通展。予以发布，谢谢。Yeah. Well, if if uh, if you do go to Shanghai, I, I can recommend that magnetic train as a way to beat Shanghai's traffic. Um, although I wish it went a bit further into the city centre, but uh, maybe in the future. Um, any other questions from the audience uh, for our our panel here of infrastructure experts? Um, right in the middle, down the front. Oh, actually. My mic. All right, and then we have a question at the back and then another one down here on the right. So we'll do, we'll do a triangle of questions. Maybe if you each ask your question and then we'll take them as a panel. Right, yeah. right. Hi, my name is Bob Sorensen with PwC here in Abu Dhabi. And I got a question for Mr. Al Habbabi, if I said it correctly. Um, if we look at the uh, UAE, there is a couple of regions that get a lot of attention and some of the regions get less attention. Um, how do you see the role of your organization to expand the economic reach within the UAE? So there's so much focus on Dubai and Abu Dhabi, but we've got Alain and we've got the Western region. Um, how would you like to facilitate the economic development in these regions? Okay, so regional development in, in UAE, and there was a question up the back. For the... Yeah. 
I'm Mayad Al Mardud uh, from Masdar Institute. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Uh, Wang uh, Jin, and I want to ask about the uh, the process of uh, implementing uh, high rails uh, or metro or a train in existing cities. How how is the procedure for uh, occupied cities? How they deal with this uh, situations? Uh, as in Abu Dhabi, if we want to apply these. Uh, plans or these uh, networks. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Okay, and then finally, question down the front. Yeah. Yeah, hi, good morning. Um, when we talk about uh, infrastructure investment, it's a long-term investment by nature. Uh, it's 10, 15, could be 20 years uh, plan and execution. But living in an environment of high uncertainty, and we talk about rapid, rapid uh, technological changes, uh, econ uh, economic and political changes, what we saw in the US, the uh, Europe, uh, the Arab world in uh, 2011 onwards. How does a decision maker take those uncertainties into consideration when making a call on, on infrastructure? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is that directed to anyone in particular or a gen general question? It's a general question. General question. Thank okay, you. thanks. So we had three questions. Um, one about uh, regional development, so in the case of the UAE, how to do things outside of Abu Dhabi and Dubai. Um, one for Mr. Wang on uh, how do you build a rail system in an existing city that maybe has no space for it. Um, and then one for the whole panel, I think, around uh, uncertainties in infrastructure development. Um, maybe Mr. Ababi, if we sure. start with you. The, uh, the Abu Dhabi plan and the economic vision for Abu Dhabi calls for the development of every uh, region, call it the Al Dafra region, the West, the uh, Al Ain region, as well as Abu Dhabi. We have mega projects in these three regions. We're not favoring any uh, of the region over the other. But you also have to respect and consider the the capital investment and the and the, the investment uh, uh, society. They go for the most attractive in terms of retail first, and then they go to the other areas. We, as a government, in the plan, in the economic plan, we make sure that we diversify the, uh, the, the field of investment. We send some investment that does not require the port, for example, or closer to, to a major city like Abu Dhabi, we send it to Al Ain like agriculture, like uh, the construction materials. We move that field to, to, to Al Ain region and other sectors as well. And we go to the, when we go to the Western region or the Al Dafra region, we tend to push the, uh, the petrochemical uh, industry to, to be on that region. Uh, to create jobs, we understand that industrial the project create jobs, create investments, create wealth in the in the area. So we, in the both vision, the the bigger one, the uh, the emirate vision, as well as the sub vision, which is the economic vision and industrial industrial strategy. It calls for what you mentioned that we have to make sure every region get a share on the investment, but the bigger share because of the supply and demand and because of the raw materials, because of the attraction and the return investment takes part in Abu Dhabi. Okay, and Mr. Wang, how about uh, the question for you on, um, it seems very difficult to build railways in cities that already exist. How, how can you overcome that? Uh, 达到二百公里
二百二十六个隧道，也就是相当于在地下山，它是一个山林的隧道。呃，我们持续了三年时间，三百五十公里运行，而且安全可靠。所以，我从专业的角度来讲，啊，这是一个不难的问题，是可以解决的。谢谢。Okay, there you go. Simple, simple answer. <laughs> Very practical. Um, and for the final question, Hans Peter, if I could bring you in on that, um, uh, some question marks around well, uncertainties in infrastructure. Um, how do you uh, build a project that might have a life of 30 or 40 years um, when, when you don't know what the future will look like? Yes, uh, actually, this is the major issue, and. Uh, there we have uh, an interesting situation also all around the globe. We have heard stability is the key uh, keyword. So politicians have to understand uh, stability as the motor of growth, of economic uh, uh, growth, social development, and finally also sustainable development. And therefore, um, it's very important also maybe to change all the linkages between politicians and uh, civil society and stakeholder management. So I, I would say we have good examples in Europe where I would say a bad stakeholder management has showed the political result uh, we have now to overcome. Uh, there and then we have further away we have other examples where I think um, political behavior will be in the long run also managed, but all in all, a long-term sustainable development can only take place with a political stability. That doesn't mean a, a political standstill, but a continuous improvement process taking the stakeholders and well-informed stakeholders into account and work with them. I think this is how you, one has to develop the political systems. Isolated systems won't get far because they will not be stable and will not be uh, uh, able to attract the necessary investments which are needed because for a sound industrial development you need connectivity, you need a strong infrastructure. And for that, you need also a social, a strong social development. So it's a call, so to say, for a wise political leadership, which has to be uh, our future, so that everybody can voice, can be part, and feels also responsible. Because the ones who are feeling part of the system feel also responsible and will also contribute to this sustainable development. Okay. Well, thanks, um, thanks to the audience for your questions there uh, and to the panel for answering them. Um, but can we just conclude by thanking our great infrastructure panel, uh, Mr. Al-Hababi, uh, Mr. Egla, uh, Dr. Ibrahim, and Mr. Wang.